Yeah, well, I reckon the world's changed a lot. It has over the last five or six years where our natural kind of big brother trading partners are kind of going down a different path than us. So I think it's time for us to really uh, drive our own strategy. So I'd love to see a renewable electric uh, New Zealand as a clean platform. And then so much new opportunity comes over the top of that. A lot of people like yourself have, have talked about never waste a good crisis. What do you mean exactly by that? Well, I think what we're seeing is that ideas that have, you think might take five to ten years, they're all being compressed down to probably a two-year time frame. There's an incredible focus now on what are, the, what, are the, what are the best use of the sort of crisis money and the crisis thinking that's going on so that we position ourselves for the future. The, the big thing is a lot of the ideas aren't new, but now there's so much focus and everyone's sort of on the same page. Now's the time to really move and be bold. I mean, to that point, how important is it that we act with speed, that we act on this opportunity now? Well, it's super, it's super important that we act with speed because, um, you know, if you're employing 40 or 50 staff, you know, you can't have months of not paying them. So, you know, we think about these sort of three waves, you know, what are things we need to do, um, you know, to get the health outcomes right and made good progress on that. And the second one, second wave is what do we need to do right now to get jobs started? So what are those shovel-ready projects? But we don't do crazy stuff. We want to do things that sort of, um, you know, makes the boat go faster. And then the, the third wave, what are those important projects that set up uh, this new uh, New Zealand for the future? What opportunities do you think we run the risk of losing if we just do just return to normal, return to the way we went about our business? Well, I think that New Zealand has been doing that for a, has been doing that for a while. I, I don't think we've had a national strategy for some years, and there's no kind of vision that all New Zealanders are kind of swimming towards, right? So now that people are really thinking about the future, there's a time to get quite crisp. You know, we know it's going to be environmentally friendly, and I think people are really wanting to see investment in infrastructure to make things better for us and for the next generation. Do you think there's an opportunity for New Zealand as a, as a country to really lead the way with some of this stuff? I mean, globally, countries are grappling with similar things on, on very different scales, obviously. But do you think New Zealand is a position to really kind of put itself at the forefront of some of these changes? Yeah, New Zealand is so interesting. We're quite timid with some things, and then we're really brave with other things like sport. When we lead, New Zealand really likes that. And, and, and what I've seen is that New Zealanders get really excited when you can unify behind a purpose, and that's, I think, the role of leaders. But you don't expect the government to have all of the ideas. They really won't. The nature of people that are doing that are quite different from those that do really sort of push the boat out. If you can put an idea out there, um, get a discussion going, then the politicians can see that there is a bit of a mandate for some of these things. So getting out there, contributing to the uh, discussion, writing articles, commenting on articles, I think is, is really important to speed things up. It's an interesting point that you make. Do you think as New Zealanders, we kind of underestimate ourselves a bit? We need to aim a bit higher. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, um, with what we did at Zero, there was so much sort of poo-pooing at the beginning, but once we, you know, started to score some, score some runs, you can see that you can be world-class. So I think, um, you know, especially business leaders that have built good export businesses know that we can be as good as anyone else, because when you, you meet your uh, competitors or other people in industry, yeah, they have massive scale, but they still think the same, they're still the same people. And I think our competitive advantage with New Zealand is we do tend to operate as a team of five million and we do things that are very much based on our values. That's when we're most successful. And I think most New Zealanders also want to give back to the country, far more so than um, those countries with larger populations. So pulling all of those things together, I think, gives us a great opportunity to absolutely lead. And, you know, what a fun thing to do for the next 20 years. What do you think are the businesses and the industries that are going to really thrive in the coming years and, and perhaps what will be their sort of shared values? But because of our value of the environment and equality, we will always look after people. So I think building um, uh, people-led solutions to this COVID crisis will absolutely uh, uh, be noted. We're definitely going to be leading on, on digital. And what's super interesting is even though total employment may fall, um, you know, you may see organisations that, you know, maybe there's 50 salespeople that won't be working, but there'll be another 20 people hired in IT to build their digital supply chains. 
So, um, you know, again, as a country, if we're involved in this global digital supply chains, then we may, we, we may be able to grow our um, employment through this process, or certainly some sectors will grow and be very strong. Just lastly, the, the, obviously the broad topic for this is talking about the vision and the vision for New Zealand looking into the future. Uh, some of this stuff is going to be long-term, long-term change, long-term projects. What do you think really needs to happen in the next few months, in the next sort of three to six months? Um, what do you think we really need to get moving on? So, so I think the big thing now, there's been lots of ideas talked about and you know, you, you're not seeing a lot of pushback on some of these ideas. So it's what's the mechanism to make them move. If we want speed, I think business has shown it can move with speed. The government's shown some real leadership in some areas, but it needs to build that relationship with business now so it can make a decision quite quickly. And business will provide uh, air cover for uh, decisions. It's a great place for ideas. There's a lot of people that can help. They're used to having governance structures and all those sort of things, so you do the right thing. They're used to communicate, so you bring every law, everyone with you as well. So I think that's the big thing now, it's working out what's that engagement model uh, between government and business and making sure it's a diverse group. So you're hitting all of the values and making sure that um, uh, there's, you know, we don't leave people behind and uh, we're building solutions that are good for all of New Zealand. Rod, what have we learnt over the last two months about how we move around? Yeah, so what we've seen is that, we, that you don't actually have to drive to work to go to work. So, um, and that really ties into the lifestyle I think we value as New Zealanders. You know, we hate sitting in traffic and I think we've shown that we don't need to. So getting that mix between working from home where we use that fantastic ultra-fast broadband infrastructure that's been put in place over the last 10 years and, um, and then balancing that with being at work at the right time. So you're having quality meetings with people and giving that sort of social connection where all that nuance happens. So I think we can be real leaders in this global working. And of course, because we're in a time zone which overlaps the US and Australia, having that time flexibility if we're building export businesses absolutely works. You've been quite outspoken in the past on some of your big ideas for our transport sector. Um, has the past two months changed the way you view that at all? Yeah, it's really interesting because we all like flying, but now you know we've seen the clean air by not flying. So one of the thing, I think one of the really big ideas is for us to lead in electric flight. You know, one of the cool things about New Zealand is we are a long skinny country, but um, you know, we're an island. 100% of our domestic network is flying under two hours. You think if we had a vision in like a 10 year time frame where we had a 100% of our domestic network flying using electricity, that would mean, you know, flight should be a whole lot cheaper if we can reduce the price of electricity, which is, you know, part of the renewable electric platform, but also we wouldn't have that carbon guilt. So I think that's really exciting and everyone's seen what it looks like to have clear skies. So I think that's a goal that all of us in New Zealand can sign up for. And obviously that doesn't just apply to air travel either. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think over the last few years, most people have had experience with electric vehicles, that's really exciting. And um, you know, most people have probably heard we're doing some amazing uh, autonomous flight trials down in the South Island at the moment. And um, there's a great opportunity for us as we think about public transport, um, working with some of those global companies, bringing them back here, using New Zealand as an R&D lab to test autonomous driving and we're actively working on a few of those projects now. The fact that so many of us, have, as you say, are now working from home and have figured out that we can work from home, what impact do you think that is going to have on, on transport and, and public transport offerings? Yeah, it's really interesting. At the moment public transport is geared around you know, a really big peak, getting everyone to work and home at the same time. So if you start to um, you know, spread that load out again, you flatten the curve of transport even, then you can have um, uh, you know, we don't need to have as much infrastructure in place, which is really interesting. If you think about it, you know, every uh, commuter has, you know, has one of these things. We know what their normal traffic patterns are. We know what the weather's going to be like next Tuesday. So you can imagine building smart networks that tie into public transport as well. And the idea of having autonomous electric vehicles, you know, small, uh, small buses that you can chain together with software is really, really interesting. And it's been fun over the last month getting to know some of these new companies. You're just getting to a threshold where technology is making that quite possible. So certainly in the next five to ten years, all of that, you know, the way that we've thought about public transport in the past, 
really changes now because we've got such more fine grain control of, of really cool, clean, small vehicles that are super cheap. Rod, how important is it now more than ever that we really start to ramp up um, our renewable energy sources? You know, we're, we're a long way from everyone else, but what we do have is rain and hills, and we're over 80% renewables right now and until we we dramatically reduce the price of electricity we won't get to 100 percent which i think would be all of our goal so and if we can do that imagine being able to you know build clean products with really low cost energy but with a renewable energy after the vw audi emissions crisis all of the big global car manufacturers needed to build electric cars and we're seeing that happening but um, people buying electric cars soon go, hey, that's great, but how did you make them? Well, if you've made those panels with renewable energy, I think that aligns more with people buying those cars. So you can see, uh, you know, with the protein we make, everything we export, if we could be using low-cost renewable electricity to build those products, you know, they, I think they're worth more on the world stage. If we see COVID-19 as an opportunity to shake up things uh, across a broad range of sectors, um, do you think renewable energy is, is one of those? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's uh, huge. We have to really think about the climate. I think what's super exciting is that now we can understand that climate change isn't something that's just out there. Quite quickly, these things can happen to us right now, not just our children. So um, I'm pretty optimistic that's going to drive, drive a whole lot of change. Renewable energy just makes so much sense now because of the climate benefits. And I think um, that people are going to be far more open and even demanding of countries to, to have a clear strategy. For there to be a really broad uptake of renewable energy across, you know, for, for all of us to switch to, to whether it be hydro or solar, what roadblocks do you think you, that need to be removed? I mean, you talk about cost, but what are some of the other things? Well, um, so in, uh, what's really interesting is that money is not a roadblock anymore because there's so much money looking for long-term infrastructure to invest in. So if you get the market architecture right, you know, if we need to get $10 billion to build some really nice big new hydro dams, then that's, that is uh, quite possible. And it may be um, that it's some pumped hydro or, or some other schemes, but having a good open scheme saying this is the outcome that we want, so therefore can we be mature about the best way to do that, that's the conversation that needs to happen now. And there's really good willingness to do that because I think technology is getting to a point where you can imagine us you know, flying domestically using uh, electricity in a 10 year time frame. So the time to have that discussion is absolutely now. Any industries or businesses that you would think would really open up to us if we did get to the point that we were 100% renewable? Well, I think um, we get to play in the global transport industry. If we can demonstrate a willingness that we're going to um, move towards um, electric transport, so um, you know, driving trucks, aviation, then if we're one of the first countries to do that, a whole lot of R&D comes in. You know, working out how the recharging systems work, how you pay for it, all the e-commerce around that. There'd be a whole lot of studies around um, how it works, how you make it convenient, ride sharing, all of those models. So I think that's, that creates a platform that a whole lot of additional investment um, takes place on. And then our businesses that are involved with that, you know, involved with smart networks, suddenly are able to export those skills for years and years in the future as the rest of the world catches up. So. That feels like you know, something that for the rest of our lives we can absolutely be leading on, which will create massive opportunity for all New Zealanders. The word sustainability seems to be thrown around a lot and used in a lot of different ways, but it feels to me that it really sits at the core of so many of these discussions we're having about how New Zealand moves on from COVID-19. Yeah, and I, and I think um, sustainability, the environment and equality are those key values that separate New Zealand from a whole lot of other places. So, and again, a, a large chunk of the world, probably half of each country, completely identifies with those values. Um, but I think we've got it, um, so probably 80% of us agree with those values, so we can move absolutely faster. And this is where being small and being nimble does allow us to lead.